Welcome to this lesson on layered protocol stacks within PCI Express. My name is Paul Barron and I will be your instructor. In this lesson, we'll be covering the PCIe layers again. We'll be looking at the error detection within layers, looking at the PCI Express mapping comparison with the OSI, and we'll be taking a look at PCI Express and switches. There'll also be a quiz at the end. So let's start. Taking a look again at the PCI Express protocol logical layer mapping, now hopefully this should start to becoming uh, familiar with you. We can see that at the top we have the transaction layer. This communicates with the application and system software. When an application makes a request for some data from a device at the other end of a PCI Express link, that, that request is passed to the transaction layer. The information from the transaction layer is then passed to the data link. And as we've seen uh, most recently, it is then passed to the physical layer where it does the logical sub-block, the scrambling and the 8B, uh, 10B encoding, and it's passed to the physical layer for transmission. The reverse is done at the other side, in which, to, in which case it takes the information, strips off the uh, added uh, encoded packets, and passes it back to the transaction layer. And in turn, it goes back to the application software. We have the option, uh, we have the, um, we're familiar now with the requester completer model. So the whole system is sitting at the root complex as the application, and it's called the requester. And it makes requests from a, re a completer, which can also be a requester if it sends data. And this is passed through the PCI Express three layer stack. So here we're seeing the whole system, which is capable of generating configuration read writes memory read writes, I.O. read writes, and messages. But on the right hand side again, you can see that for a device to be specification compliant, it only needs to respond to configuration read writes. The memory, I.O. and messages, they're just uh, optional. But at the bare minimum, the PCI Express device, the endpoint, has to respond to configuration read write cycles. We spoke about um, earlier the end-to-end -end service. Now this is the end-to-end -end, uh, reference in the transaction layer. So when a transaction layer packet can be created, there can be information in that trans transaction layer that gets passed from um, one transaction layer to the other. And this is the data payload for one, but also other things such as the end-to-end -end CRC, which is optional, or sent through the system. However, as it passes through the stack, the data link layer adds it, its parts to it as does the, the physical layer, but these are stripped off at the the point-to-point -point connection. So for example, in the switch, that would take away the, the data link layer packet and then uh, recreate it with inside the switch. So here we're looking at the data link layer. This provides the point-to-point -point, uh, service. So here we're only con it's only considered uh, valid between two connections of a PCI link. It's not considered across the entire network, as is the, uh, the TLP. And here we can just see that when information comes through, it gets stripped off at the data link layer before being passed to the transaction layer for onward, uh, onward progression. And at the physical layer, we've already seen that uh, this is the point in which the, uh, the packets are turned into the, into the logical ones and zeros using the differential uh, signaling scheme and that's sent across the, uh, the, the lanes, uh, which constitute a link, to the other connection on the other side of the, uh, the link. We talk a little bit now about the error detection within the layers, and PCI Express provides uh, for required and optional error detection and logging capabilities at all layers of the protocol stack. So here we see the TLP packet. Again, you, start, you see the, the unique bit patterns or framing uh, symbols which are added by the DLLP. And we see that the uh, sequence number, so we can get uh, errors indicated if we miss a particular sequence number. And we can see that we have the TLP header file here, which is used for explicit forwarding. And this is an optional feature. And it was included uh, a little bit earlier with the uh, TLP processing hints. And what it means is if, uh, if this is actually implemented, and there's a register that de determines the amount of uh, uh, prefix that you can add to a TLP. If that's correct, uh, incorrect, sorry, that then gets reported as an error. Likewise, with the ECRC, which is the end-to-end -end CRC, 
another optional uh, transaction layer uh, error detection method. If that uh, is appended and the other, uh, the receiver supports this, finds an error, that again is, is registered as an error and uh, passed through the stack. The link CRC is not optional and that's done at the point to point port, as is the end to end where you, uh, you, you validate that the particular packet is correct. So here what we're looking at is the mapping between the various uh, technologies. So you can see Ethernet on the left and how that maps into say a fiber channel stack. We looked at the OSI in the previous module. We have the uh, internet protocol suite, the InfiniBand and at the far, far right we see the, uh, the three layer PCI Express uh, stack and sitting at the top there it's called the requester completer model which is the application layer and in order for the requester and completer to communicate, they communicate using the transaction data link and physical layers. So here we can see that they map in uh, the physical is a straightforward map. The data link maps to the link layer and uh, we see that the transaction layer maps between the network and the transport. And this would be the session, uh, transport and network links inside the OSI model. So PCI Express and switches. Now we've seen quite a few diagrams that show switches within uh, uh, PCI Express Fabric and we've seen them connected normally to the, the root complex and initially I said that uh, switches were really used in, in its basic form as a fan out mechanism. So for example in the root complex if you had uh, a single root port and you wanted to transmit data to multiple devices, remember you can only communicate to one device on a PCI Express link because the device can only be device zero. In this case, you can use a, a, a switch which will then fan out the particular ports. So you could have a, a one root port at the root complex, and then you can send that to three other devices. So packets are transmitted and received within switches and they contain information in the headers and they're required for routing and scheduling, such as which port to send this packet to, which packets are priorities and we saw that uh, using traffic classes and virtual channels we're able to um, implement some uh, differentiated, uh, differentiated services within PCI Express and we can arbitrate for um, access to a particular virtual link and uh, we also are able to put can errors occur with certain packet or traffic types so these are as we saw earlier with the optional can you can you put that in there is also um, error poisoning that we saw earlier and they can be passed through switches. Looking at PCI Express devices and the protocol layering, each uh, host um, PCI to PCI bridge contains, in effect, uh, every port contains this information, the three layer stack. So looking at the root complex again, you can see that every port contains this uh, transaction layer, data link layer and physical layer in order to transfer information from the host I.O. controller uh, within the system to the devices that exist in the PCI Express fabric. And you can see that within the switch. So in the switch, the upstream port, this is the port closest to the root complex as the three layer stack. There's two downstream ports, those are the ports further away from the upstream port and they're connected to Express devices which contain the same three layer or, or um, PCI Express stack. And again, what would those, uh, the type headers that will be sitting in those express devices? These are type zero headers. The type headers that are sitting in the switch, those are clusters type one. So there's different types of switches. So in serial communication, switches are often classified as store and forward. What these mean is it must validate the packet before forwarding it. There's a, a cut through mechanism. And what this can do is it can begin to forward the packet before the impact, entire packet is received. That's because uh, when you're sending packets through, a lot of the information on where it's going to go is, is in, the first, um, in, in the first bytes of data. So it can start to, send, start to prepare to send that packet before everything's uh, received. And then you have the adaptive type uh, mechanism, which is a combination of, of the two, the store and forward and the cut through. And then with the switches, you also have uh, things called blocking versus non-blocking. We'll take a look at that in, in a slide in a moment. In PCI Express, switches and root ports can operate in any of these modes. And as we'll show with some graphics, every packet is acknowledged on a point-to-point -point basis. We saw that with the 
ACNAC mechanism earlier and uh, through the data link layer processing uh, packets. Taking a look at the uh, switches now, we look at the store and forward. So this switch, we see that the packet's coming in. It's coming into one of the downstream ports, so it's in effect arriving on a downstream port ingress. The packet is then, uh, the packet must be stored internally to the switch and validated before that packet is then sent to another port. In this case, it's sending it to port four uh, through the egress port. So just to uh, confirm this, the packet comes in, the packet is stored internally while it calculates all the LCRCs and everything and does all the error checking. It does that before it forwards it to the egress port. Now in a cut through mechanism, because the packet routing, as I said earlier, uh, the routing information is near the beginning of the received packet, it can be forwarded to a destination port before the entire packet is received at the ingress port. So in this case, you can see the packets coming in. It's already been it's starting to appear on the egress port of port four. And then the adaptive mechanism is, uh, this operates in both cut through and um, it, in both in uh, adaptive mode, operates in cut through mode and store and forward. And internally, it calculates the linked CRCs and keeps track of the number of linked CRCs. Because you may have noticed that one of the disadvantages of the, of the cut through mechanism is that if a, a, a packet is uh, deemed to be incorrect, it's already sent part of it through and it has to completely resend it from scratch. Uh, so obviously, in one respect, you can get a performance benefit because it's not storing it and sending it on. You're, you're getting a nice cut. Uh, you're nice getting a cut through. But if the packet is seen to be uh, faulty, then you've got to retransmit anyway. So the adaptive switch, what this does, it keeps track of the number of CR CRC errors. And if it feels that there's no benefit in using the cut through due to the number of CRCs that it's receiving, it receives it reverts back to the store and forward. Uh, mechanism and it uses buffer management uh, with the ability to set special thresholds and this is uh, particularly this is vendor specific vendor and technology specific we spoke about earlier blocking and non-blocking and oversubscribed so this is uh, a nice graphic to show that within a switch you have the potential of, uh, of, of having traffic which is blocked and what this means is that a switch is, is blocking if it cannot make a connection uh, so packets are coming in and you can see the, the cross is there. It cannot make the, the particular connection and the packets are blocked. A switch is over is oversubscribed if there is not enough bandwidth to send all traffic. Now normally uh, this can occur if you've got downstream ports which are very wide so you're using multi-lane links but the port in which you're trying to send that traffic out is only uh, a subset, maybe only a by one or a by two. In which case, then, uh, you try to buffer the data, but very shortly, the switch will get oversubscribed and won't be able to handle the, uh, the traffic and keep up to keep the pace of the traffic that's coming on its uh, ingress ports. A switch can be uh, considered non-blocking and non-oversubscribed if, in this example, if ports 1, 2 and 3, you can see as the downstream, uh, downstream ports, can receive and they can forward all those packets simultaneously to port 4 within a fixed processing time within the switch. And of course, this means then that port four, if port four is the uplink, and um, we were showing this to a root complex, it would mean that port four has to be greater or equal to the sum of the speeds on ports one, two, and three, in order for it to be not uh, oversubscribed. And this, real, this makes sense. In, uh, so when you're doing the architecture of your device, you would normally look at the potential traffic flow within your system. Um, we saw earlier that there is the prospect of making peer-to-peer -peer communications using these address routing, the base limit registers. So if you were able to understand that on particular devices, there's likely to be a lot of traffic coming in and they're all beginning to send that traffic to a given port, then it would make sense to make that port a wider link such that the sum of traffic that can go through the egress is greater than the sum of traffic can, that can appear on um, the number of ports of the, of the switch. So this is what it's uh, saying on that one. So anyway, this brings to the end of uh, this particular module. There's a quiz, so please, um, you can access this under the Course and Materials tab. Please take the quiz, or you can take the interactive online quiz.
Thanks for joining me.